Hey, everybody. I wanted to give an introduction to the sparsity promoting L1 norm. So this material is from two papers by David Donahoe, um, one from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science and one a technical report. I should say that the second paper is also with his co-author, Tanner. All right, so let's give ourselves a D by N matrix, capital A. So capital A maps from N dimensional space into D dimensional space, and it's gonna decrease dimensions. So we're mapping from a high dimensional space into a lower dimensional one. And um, we're gonna look at the solutions to Y equals AX, okay? So X is in our high N dimensional space. Y is in our lower D dimensional space. Think of Y as a fixed constant vector, you know? So, so here I have um, D equations in N unknowns, the, the entries of X. And D is smaller than N. So this is an underdetermined system. In general, I expect to have infinitely many solutions. You know, uh, I expect to have um, a, a um, affine subspace worth of solutions of dimension N minus D. So since we expect to have infinitely many solutions, we're gonna pick a solution that has the best property and the property that we're gonna look for is we're gonna pick the solutions that, that is the sparsest, that has the fewest number of non-zero entries. So what I've written here is um, notation for the L0 norm of the vector X. I should say norm in quotes because the L1 norm is indeed a norm the L infinity norm is indeed a norm. The L2 norm is indeed an, a norm. You know, the, the L0 norm is not a norm. It doesn't satisfy all the properties of, an, of a norm in mathematics, but it does sat satisfy some of them. Um, so let me say this notation means the number of non-zero entries in vector x. All right. So unfortunately, this problem that we'd like to find the answer to, right, of not just finding any solution, but finding the sparsest solution x, it's NP hard. Um, and, and what it boils down to is that, is that balls in this L0 norm are not convex. They're not shaped like typical balls. If I try to draw all the points in the plane who have zero norm at most one, well, they have at most one non-zero entry. So that's just the coordinate axes, right? That doesn't look like a ball. <laughs> it doesn't look like a round ball or even a diamond shaped ball or a square shaped ball as you might, might expect balls with respect to different norms to look. Um, you know, if I'm in R3 and I ask what's all the vectors with L0 norm at most one, again, it's just the three coordinate axes now in R3. And if I'm in R3 and I ask for the ball of all points whose L0 norm is at most two, I get the union of the coordinate planes. Um, and again, that doesn't look very much like a ball. It's, it's not a convex set. All right. Um, one way that you can prove that this is NP hard is that you can show how, if you could solve this problem, you could solve well known combinatorial optimization problems that are, that are well known to be NP hard, like the uh, knapsack problem or the satisfiability problem. Those are NP hard combinatorial problems that if you could solve this. Uh, L0 norm problem, you could also solve those NP hard combinatorics problems. Okay. What's magical, however, and which is why I'm sharing this topic with you, is there's a relaxation of problem zero 
to get problem one. It's, it's a convex relaxation. This, this function that we're trying to optimize is not convex, but you can consider the convex relaxation. And, um, and now you get an easier problem to solve. So we're gonna minimize not the zero norm of X, but the one norm of X subject to the same constraints. Okay. This problem will be easy to solve. Okay, it's um, as we'll discuss. What's nice, however, is that the solution to problem one oftentimes is identical to the solution to problem zero, so long as the solution that you find is sparse enough. So the situation that, that um, we find ourselves in is you often want to pro solve problem zero, find the sparsest possible solution. There's no good algorithms for doing that, except you can solve problem one, okay? And you can use linear programming to solve problem one. And then if the solution that you find has few enough zeros, there are sometimes guarantees that the solution that you found to problem one is also guaranteed to be an optimal solution to problem zero. Okay, so not in all cases, but in many cases, you can just solve this much faster linear programming problem and get essentially a guarantee that it solves also um, uh, this, this uh, zero known problem, which is known to be NP hard in general. So let me talk about this L1 norm. You know, the, the L1 norm of a vector is just the sum of the absolute values of the entries. So the L1 norm of X is just the absolute value of the first coordinate plus the absolute value of the second coordinate plus dot, 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 plus the absolute value of the last coordinate. All right. So, you know, if my vector has just two entries, X and Y, the L1 norm would be the absolute value of X plus the absolute value of Y. Um, so in 2D, this is the set of all points whose L1 norm, absolute value of X1 plus absolute value of X2 is at most one. In 3D, this octahedron is the um, L1 ball, the set of all points where the absolute value of X1 plus the absolute value of X2 plus the absolute, absolute value of X3 is at most one. Um, another name for the L1 ball, you know, of radius one, is just the cross polytope. Um, these L1 balls are the same as just taking the convex hull of the standard basis vectors along with their negatives. So take E1 and its negative, E2 and its negative, take the convex hull. That's called the cross polytope or the L1 ball of radius one. And, and same thing in 3D, take E1 and its negative, E2 and its negative, and E3 and its negative. Take the convex hull, you get the cross polytope, or the same thing, uh, the L1 ball of radius at most one. I've, I've drawn some pictures here for you um, of this problem when A is of different sizes. So here's a picture where A maps from uh, 2D to 1D. And so we expect to have um, a one parameter family of solutions. Right, these might be what all of our solutions X to Y equals AX looks like. Okay, the way you should think of solving this problem one is you should take this diamond, this L1 ball, and then blow it up until it first hits your, your affine subspace of solutions. Okay, so we take this pokey diamond and we just blow it up until it first touches uh, this collection of solutions. If we did that here, you know, we'd blow up this diamond and we'd get something like this. You'll notice that where those first intersect, where the L1 ball as I blow it up, increase the radius, first intersects our collection of solutions, happens at a sparse point, right? The x1 coordinate of this blue point is zero. So these L1 balls are sort of spiky enough 
that they promote sparsity, the solution that you find often has many zero entries. This next picture is for a, a matrix that maps from 3D down to 1D. So we expect to have a two parameter family of, of solutions to y equals ax. And same thing in 3D, if I take this L1 ball, this um, octahedron and blow it up, you know, the point where it first intersects is actually in this picture, it's actually just gonna have one non-zero entry. The, the upwards entry is gonna be non-zero, whereas the entries in the other directions are gonna be zero. And just for completeness, uh, here's a picture where our matrix A maps from 3D down to 2D. Here are, we expect to have a one parameter family of solutions in 3D. So these are the solutions X to Y equals AX. Here they are, it's this line. And now when you expand this cross polytope, you know, you expect it to hit the line, probably not at a vertex, which would be the sparsest possible way it could intersect but it's probably gonna intersect along one of these edges of the octahedron, okay? Right, one of these edges is gonna be the first to intersect that line as I pump air into this um, uh, octahedron or L1 ball. And along this edge, that's still a relatively sparse solution, right? The X1 coordinate along that edge is zero. So two of the entries are non-zero but, but one of the entries is still zero, which is, which is sparse in, in a weaker sense. So right. Oftentimes the L1 norm is described as promoting sparsity exactly for this re reason. The L1 ball is pokey enough that when it intersects things, it usually intersects on a lower dimensional face, which means many of the entries are zero. But, but here in this, in this video, I'm trying to describe a little bit of the pure mathematics, which is behind this. Um, okay, so a zero dimensional face of this L1 ball has, um, has one vertex and it has one non-sparse entry, one non-zero entry. A one dimensional face you know, is between two vertices and so it's going to have two non-zero entries. And that, and that continues as such. So a k minus one, let's say a k-dimensional face has k plus one vertices. So if you intersect at a k-dimensional face, you're sparse in the sense that all of the entries of your vector are zero, except at most k plus one of them. All right. So what do Donahoe and his collaborators and his contemporaries prove? They prove exactly what I was alluding to. In some sense, solving problem zero, which had the L0 norm, can often be solved when you instead solve problem one, which has this L1 norm. So the overwhelming majority of matrices A that go from n-dimensional space to d-dimensional space um, with, with n large, so when we're, su we're in sufficiently high dimension, and d can only be at most, you know, roughly um, uh, seven-tenths of n, okay? So if n is 100-dimensional, we want d at most 70-dimensional. So we're uh, reducing dimension by at least 30%. So the overwhelming majority of these matrices in a precise random sense that we're not gonna be, make precise, have the property that if X is a solution to our, you know, our original problem, we want X to have as few non-zero entries as possible. If you have a solution that has not that many zeros at most you know, half times dimension D non-zero entries, then, X is also the unique solution to this problem one, minimizing the L1 norm. And what that allows you to do is don't try to solve this NP hard problem with the L0 norm. Solve this problem with the L1 norm. If you have few enough zeros, 
then that's also the unique solution to the, to the true sparsity uh, optimizing problem. So once again, this is problem zero. Overall solutions, we're trying to minimize the L0 norm. NP hard to solve in general. This is problem one. Overall solutions, we're trying to find the solution with the minimum L1 norm. You can solve this via linear programming. Do it. When you do so, if you find a solution that has few enough zeros, at most half times the dimension D um, non-zeros, few enough non-zeros, then your solution to this easy problem to solve is also um, the unique solution to this much harder problem. All right. So it's, it's sort of a magical fact. On average or in general or most of the time, you can solve this very hard L0 problem by just considering the L1 relaxation. One last thing that I forgot to say is that this L1 problem, it's not, it's not linear, right? Because, um, um, you know, this is not a, a linear function. We have these absolute values in there, right? Um, so if I was just in 1D and I looked at the absolute value of X1, you know, it looks something like that. That's not a linear function, okay? But it's piecewise linear. It's linear on each piece. And that piecewise linearity is what allows you to massage this and recast it as a truly linear function, uh, optimization problem. So as I've written it here, it's not, it's not uh, strictly linear yet, but you can massage it a bit to make it linear. All right, thanks so much for your time and attention. My next video will be on the same theme, but I'll explain the connection to polytopes and neighborly polytopes. Thanks.